The following episode of Politics and Science features an interview with Dr. Raymond Peet, endocrinologist and physiologist from Eugene, Oregon. It was recorded on July 24th, 2008. At that time, we were struggling with a, how shall I say, a not very well-functioning phone interface machine at WMRWLP Warren. And so the sound is a little funky. I've put it through some sound modifying programs, and it sounds a little echoey now, but the buzz is gone. And I hope it's listenable. Uh, more information about Dr. Raymond Pete can be found at raypeat.com. That's spelled R-A-Y-P-E-A-T dot com, where you'll find many fascinating articles. And if you enjoyed the show or didn't catch all of it and wanted to hear the rest, you can browse your way on a computer to radio numeral four all dot net. That's radio number four all dot net. And once you get there, search for politics and science and you'll find a number of episodes ready to download to your computer to listen to at your convenience. All right, and now to the interview itself. Raymond, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, let me hang up the phone. All right, thanks for joining us again. Let's see if I can get my knobs adjusted here correctly. All right, you're on the air, and we're speaking with Dr. Raymond Pete out in Eugene, Oregon. He's an endocrinologist and physiologist who's written a lot of books about health and nutrition and science and has a newsletter called Ray Pete's Newsletter, and you can find him on the web at raypete.com. Raymond, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Okay. Thought I lost you for a minute. Um, just yesterday, we were doing a sound check, and and we sort of picked up where we left off last week talking about fats, fats in our diet and uh, the use of fats by humans over the years and also as animal feed. Um, and yesterday you were talking about cholesterol um, and you mentioned a fellow named Chris Masterjohn and I thought perhaps we could, one of the things you said yesterday that kind of shocked me was that um, for years we've heard that cholesterol is uh, something you get from fat, from butter, from, uh, you know, especially beef fat, any of those uh, you know, meats that are full of s supposedly saturated fats, and that's why we're being so poisoned by cholesterol, and it turns out that perhaps cholesterol isn't the boogeyman we always thought it was. It's actually um, something we need to function. And um, Yeah, but eating uh, cholesterol, if you're healthy, uh, you have to eat a tremendous amount, like the experiment where uh, they had healthy, uh, I think they were young men, eat eggs until they could see an increase in blood cholesterol. And it took 22 eggs before they saw a rise in the day's cholesterol. And it, it does rise if you're very sick and can't compensate. But uh, in a practical situation, where a person um, might want to raise their cholesterol, you can usually do it just by eating lots of fruit because uh, for, for several reasons, the minerals and sugar in the fruit uh, give the liver the energy it needs to make adequate cholesterol. And uh, there's, they call it a U-shaped uh, curve of mortality. Um, you have an ideal range of cholesterol uh, for a given age, and when you're below that range, your mor mortality increases. Uh, what what are those ra what are those ranges, Raymond? Oh, uh, the published uh, the people who talk about the curve usually put the bottom of the U around 160 to 180, but uh, when you look at the figures, the, uh, the bottom really varies with age. Like one study uh, looked at people in a nursing home situation and uh, saw that the ones who had the highest 
cholesterol. Um, I think I've, in that group, those with 270 lived the longest. <laughs> so it, you have to think about the relation of the cholesterol to the stress you're under and uh, consider it an anti-stress hormone. Yeah, my father recently was told that he has to take start taking statins, um, and a lot of people are on statins. What's what's your opinion? Well, uh, years ago, uh, they started seeing increased mortality uh, as they used drugs to lower uh, cholesterol. And there was one, I think it was Hungarian, in uh, the 1980s that showed a great increase in cancer mortality uh, as they lowered cholesterol. And that somewhat accorded with a Veterans Administration study in uh, the 1960s that uh, they stopped when they saw that uh, the people on the so-called heart protective low-fat diet were dying at a higher rate from cancer. But um, there are still uh, some lingering uh, data showing that the statins might increase total mortality, but uh, the marketing is so intense that uh, they managed to place articles uh, convincing people how good it is. A recent book by Melody Peterson, I think the title is Our Daily Meds, <clears throat> uh, gives a lot of information about how the drug industry manipulates the culture, uh, paying doctors, well, writing articles for doctors and just getting them to sign their names and then publishing them in prestigious journals promoting their products. Uh, that it gives a little bit of the uh, inside information about how they're actually buying the medical literature. And uh, Marsha Angel, seeing it from an editor's viewpoint at the uh, New England Journal of Med Medicine, emphasized that uh, the editorial decisions can uh, completely bias the results of a uh, topic by if uh, people choose not to even submit their data because it doesn't support the efficacy of a drug or the safety. Uh, a lot of studies will simply not get submitted and then if the editors introduce more bias, you might have 50 studies showing a drug is harmful and useless and uh, one that gets published showing that it's uh, beneficial. In increasingly, um, Melody Peterson shows how the, the drug industry is not only uh, modifying the research that gets done and uh, how the universities uh, treat their research, but uh, how the journals publish it, and then finally how the doctors use it. So the system is pretty well sewed up now. Anything relating to uh, drug therapy, you, you just simply can't trust the Anglo-American literature, and increasingly it has spread into uh, Italy, Chile, uh, France, uh, Japan, as the industries uh, become influential in those countries. Um, India and Russia were relatively outside the um, commercial pharmaceutical uh, influence, but now they're moving in that direction too. So that's a, an effect of globalization, I suppose, is that uh, <laughs> yeah. the same corporate um, policies. Yeah, still some of the um, more backward economies uh, still manage to do some real research. So, yeah, I've, I've heard it said that we have one of the most effective uh, propaganda systems uh, in world history, basically, uh, in this country at this time, with uh, access to the media pretty much sewn up by the corporations and uh, alternative voices only heard on stations like ours, which uh, community stations, which 
there's quite a few of them around the country, but uh, there's a lot of space in between them. So, uh, how's the media situation out in Oregon? Oh, um, well, in my lifetime, uh, the Pacifica stations have been the outstanding exceptions, but uh, the uh, university uh, public radio station uh, about, I guess, 10 years, 15 years ago, uh, it changed its format so that students don't have the access they used to, and now it sounds like one of those big city furniture advertising classical music stations. Well, that's, it used to be more of a community station? Yeah, it, it used to be a really good station, but uh, the um, donors uh, made it sound like like one of those upper class, nothing but classic music stations. Yeah, that's, uh, we're having, we tried to, well, we have a pretty small range here, but we do have an affiliation with Pacifica and with other community stations around the country, so we try to uh, network our programming and share it uh, oh, between us all. So. Well, getting back to uh, cholesterol, and um, there was a the guy you, you said the last time you were on the air, you spoke about somebody named Chris Masterjohn. Um, um, yeah, I've read several of his articles that are very good. My only disagreement with him is that he uh, persists in believing in essential fatty acids. I see. Yeah, that's a, something a lot of alternative, quote, alternative health people are, are believe in. And what's, in a nutshell, what's your view on the essential fatty acids, just so everybody knows? Well, the, um, the first claim was that it was linoleic acid, then maybe linolenic was added. But um, already, um, after the Burr's studies of the late 20s and early 30s, um, by the 1940s, uh, their disease was shown to be nothing but a vitamin B6 deficiency. And at, at just about the same time, the uh, agricultural researchers were showing that linolenic and linoleic acid were the causes of uh, brain degeneration, testicular degeneration and infertility, and um, muscle degeneration. And, uh, Fish oils, about the same time, were causing uh, mink degenerative disease, and then the um, yellow fat disease was showing up in more and more animals as they were uh, fed fish waste um, because of an excess of the polyunsaturated fats in the fish fats. And <clears throat> so the the um, Linoleic acid finally was recognized to be essential for cancer, but uh, not at all essential for nutrition. And uh, the publicity coming out that <clears throat> the original essential fatty acids were essential for cancer kind of discouraged the, the uh, marketing in that direction, and that's when it shifted to uh, marketing fish oil as the new version of the essential fatty acids. And that's where we are now at the pretty much the peak of the fish oil promotion as the, the um, new fatty acids that are being uh, recommended um, at higher intake levels to uh, actually function as drugs to supposedly cure a, a lot of diseases, but in fact the, the old research going back 40, 50 years shows that um, it is simply a, a temporary suppression of inflammatory sy symptoms while uh, in the long run increasing the inflammatory degenerative processes. So the reason people have a, a subsiding of their symptoms is just their their immune system has been uh, yeah um, knocked down. David Horbin, who was a big promoter of polyunsaturated fats and who died of brain cancer and 
and was trying to treat himself with his own fats. He published work showing that uh, fish oil is very immune suppressive and uh, others looking at why fish oil is anti-inflammatory found that it wasn't the original um, long chain uh, polyunsaturated fats that are found in the fish but when they are processed and hit the hot organs of, of a mammal they uh, break down and it's the breakdown products the aldehydes and free radicals that are decomposed from the fish oils which are actually the anti-inflammatory substances hmm. so it's, it's the deterioration of the uh, material that produces temporary relief but it's also those things which contribute to the serious long-range problems such as brain damage and vascular damage and so on. And you were, you were saying last week that the fish oil does have some um, good properties about it. It has lots of vitamin A and D. Uh, yeah, so if it you depends can... on how it's made, but it, uh, it's in its crude form, it does come with a lot of vitamin D and A. I see. So if there was some way to get those vitamins out without... I, yeah, they, there have been uh, a lot of um, products on the market extracted from fish liver oil uh, in which they concentrate the vitamin D and A a lot so that you can get your daily dose in a couple drops of the oil. And some people are taking fish oil for uh, anti-depression. Uh, I think they're called Omega Brights or something, some such. Yeah, the, there have been studies... Uh, even in the published literature, uh, the ones I've seen were just about an equal number saying it isn't effective as say it is effective. Same with uh, using it as a supplement to baby food. Uh, there are studies that show that it retards eye and brain development, even though they don't get discussed very much. Is that the DHA? Yeah. And they've started adding that to, to, to baby food? Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, how did we get on fish oil, Raymond? Do you remember? Um, well, it's um, being promoted as an essential. Oh, that's right. Thank you. And uh, so flaxseed oil has gone out of fashion. I, I didn't realize that. And, and now they're promoting mostly fish oil in the alternative medicine field? I think so, yeah. The, mm -hmm. um, the literature in the 1980s just became overwhelming, showing that linoleic acid in particular is really the basic motor for pushing cancer excess, and linolenic isn't quite as bad, and so flax isn't as bad as, as uh, some of the others. Mm. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Raymond Pete. If anybody would like to ask uh, Dr. Pete a question, there's no other phone line here, but I can receive emails at uh, info at wmrw.org. So that's info at wmrw.org. So if essential oils are not, um, or if they're only essential for uh, creating disease, um, how is it that... Uh, that they're so heavily promoted by the government. Oh, um, several years ago, the FDA had a warning not to use more than, I think it was three grams a day of those uh, long chain unsaturated fats from fish oil. And I think they've dropped that warning, at least it isn't prominent like it used to be. And uh, I think Right from its very beginning, the FDA was uh, captured by the food industry and then the drug industry. And uh, now they, they really are working primarily as a, a corporate uh, defense system. Yeah, it always seems like they absorb the liability for the um, corporations by, by, if they approve it, then you can't sue the corporation. Yeah, the same thing as uh, government uh, 
protecting the nuclear industry by saying you can't collect more than a certain amount of damages if you have a reactor explode in your neighborhood. Right, so basically the, the, the oil industry is underwritten by, by the government. Yeah, it, um, the, the public health service um, has a, a worse record than the FDA itself. The FDA interfaces with the consumers and uh, tries to keep them happy, but the, uh, at higher levels, the uh, agencies of the government have, have been uh, more uh, defensive of the power structure and pretty much uh, ignoring the consumer level. Like in the uh, years of the fallout uh, from atmospheric bomb testing, the Public Health Service was destroying data and uh, putting out false data about the safety of radiation. Yeah, that is very telling of how the uh, the government can work at its worst. Um, maybe you could talk about radiation for a minute and, and how the uh, government's bias towards that has made it um, more widespread. Uh, well, the, for 50, or I guess 60 years, I've been hearing from dentists and doctors that the dose we give you in examining you is very small and harmless. And then they reduce it tenfold, and they say exactly the same thing. Uh, and the words are the same in 1940, 1950, right down to uh, the current, uh, they, they claim they have uh, digitalized machines. People think it's just bits of information coming through their bodies, but uh, it's uh, still the same old x-rays that are uh, exciting their cells. And the, um, even Linus Pauling uh, took uh, a less than adequate biological view. He was the one warning about the dangers, but he was looking only at the DNA damage. But the damage is much subtler than uh, uh, breaking strands of DNA. Uh, the the um, excited electrons cause chemical and physiological changes that linger uh, completely distinct from the immediate uh, reaction of radiation with the DNA. So that, for example, you can uh, give uh, a dose of radiation to cells in a dish and then add new cells uh, that weren't exposed to radiation to that dish, and the new cells will start mutating uh, a day or more later from something emitted by the exposed cells. And that process lingers in the tissues and the blood serum, and uh, it's called the bystander effect that you can demonstrate in the lab. Cells that weren't exposed start behaving as if they were exposed by contact with, with the damaged cells. And uh, people exposed from the Hiroshima bomb have been studied 60 years later, and they still showed essentially excited electronic states in their tissues. And the same with people, uh, I guess, about 20 years after the Chernobyl uh, exposure, their serum is still toxic. It can be um, removed from their, their blood and uh, added to um, healthy cells, and the healthy cells begin mutating. So it's, it's the bystander effect which lingers um, and might continue causing mutations, but it's a completely separate process from mutation. And so the assumptions, the safety assumptions were based on uh, the uh, model of 
how a beam of radiation will affect a molecule. And um, so it was worked out in terms of direct interaction between a molecule and radiation, but in the organism that simply isn't how it works. And uh, the Russians, way back in the 60s, were showing that um, where the Western paradigm was that if you irradiated an animal's brain, it would go into estrus, uh, causing supposedly uh, something was altered in the pituitary, causing the ovaries to produce more estrogen. Uh, the Russians did a control experiment in which they irradiated the animal's foot instead of its brain and it went into estrus. And um, so it's, they called them uh, uh, some kind of uh, radiation toxin that was emitted by the exposed tissue, but it's the same thing that happens in the bystander effect. It's uh, some uh, physiological biochemical change that is started by the radiation but then spreads and continues and the increased estrogen happens to imitate these processes started by the radiation. So there are probably many levels from the single cell which emits the bystander acting substances to the whole organism in which estrogen becomes one of the bystander uh, activating substances. So you're saying a, a little bit of red, um Radiation causes this cascading effect throughout the, yeah, throughout the yeah, body. Um, uh, two or three years ago in Seattle, uh, they were using the low-level, uh, fancy, latest, well-calibrated uh, X-ray equipment and covering the patients with uh, lead aprons and so on. And they found that a full set of dental X-rays, if the woman was pregnant at the time, even though her body was shielded thoroughly, her baby turned out underweight, uh, showing that basically the same effects as taking a dose of estrogen while pregnant, it uh, spreads a, a stress influence that uh, malnourishes the developing fetus and causes its brain to uh, develop uh, less fully than uh, an unexposed fetus. Now, the method you used to describe how the government assessed the dangers of uh, radiation poisoning, uh, where they just sort of um, had a hypothetical theory that, you know, one molecule being affected by uh, ionizing radiation, um, but they didn't take into account the living being. Uh, I think you've said before that that's common. And, in, um, in how science is conducted in the West, that uh, they do a lot of experiments uh, in test tubes, basically. Um, yeah, and worse than that, rather than the, if you look through PubMed, you see lots of abstracts described as, as in vitro, but now they have the concept in silico. And what does it, that mean? It means they didn't have anything living at all. It was all done in a computer. But people read the article, and they're used to seeing in vitro, and they think real cells were involved. But in silico uh, means in the computer. <laughs> I've never heard of that before. <laughs> in silico. So, and uh, what's wrong with that, Ray? What's wrong with doing, mo I guess that's modeling, basically, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's like the... Uh, medieval arguments about angels, uh, how, how, how much floor space does an angel need to dance and how many can get on the head of a pin. You mean it's meaningless, unless it's, unless yeah, something's... worse than meaningless. Ah. It, it is a way of amplifying your uh, favorite uh, hypothesis or assumption. It'll actually uh, promote some 
absolutely wrong theory if you if you do your modeling right. Yeah. So, in studying science, I think a lot of people are a little bit confused that um, you know we just figure it's empirical and they're testing theories all the time, and then, of course the the best theory will end up on top top because uh, you know it'll get the most positive results and. Uh, how come isn't how come that isn't the way it works? Uh, lots of reasons, but the probably the the basic thing is that it's all filtered through the culture and the system of assumptions, and uh, the assumptions. If, if you look at at different cultures. Uh, the the whole background of philosophy and religion uh, influences what you think can be taken seriously as an assumption, and uh, because of the in the medieval times people believed in alchemy and the influence of the planets and uh, astrology. Uh, the ordinary chemists and uh, physiologists uh, think it's absurd to consider the phase of the moon when you're doing a chemical or biological study. But uh, several people have looked at, at lab results uh, done over a period of time and have seen that uh, the uh, phase of the moon does influence many experiments in the lab and for example I worked in the hamster lab at the university where the um, indoor temperature was kept constant and the light was artificially controlled so uh, a person would not have any uh, cues indoors uh, whether it was winter or summer but uh, Somehow the hamsters knew what was going on outside the walls because their thymuses would atrophy in uh, the winter season and come back in the spring, just like they do when they're exposed to changing day length. And uh, that um, was um, investigated. Um, uh, Professor Brown in Indiana did many tests uh, with potatoes, oysters, and uh, flowering plants. And uh, he had noticed that his um, experiments varied with the moon. And uh, he got some oysters from the East Coast and studied their metabolism in Indiana. and. If it had been genetically determined the way the uh, paradigm said it must be, because hamsters can't know when it's winter if you're controlling their light cycle, so it must be a, some kind of a genetically operated clock in their brains. Uh, Brown uh, took his oysters to Indiana, and uh, they were still. Uh, metabolically cycling as if the tides were coming into Indiana. And uh, he did the same thing with potatoes, which uh, aren't susceptible to tides, and so no one knew about monthly cycles in potatoes. But he saw a similar metabolic um, moon cycle in potato metabolism. And flowering plants that uh, he, he saw that he could take up one of these plants that opens its petals at dawn and closes them at sunset. Taking it indoors, they still kept up the same cycle. And so he took it into a, a big building that, um, where the, no cues from the outside apparently reached, and they still did it. So he took it, his plants into a mine shaft, and they kept cycling until they got down, I forget, I think it was hundreds of feet below the surface. 
uh, the plants finally didn't receive a cue and no longer cycled. Um, so his, he demonstrated that something um, a lunar or planetary influence was able to penetrate hundreds of feet of uh, shielding and uh, his, his plant showed that when properly shielded they no longer cycled disproving the idea that it's a genetic uh, clock and uh, other people uh, were able to train plants to move their leaves at different times of day by giving them cues that overrode the uh, environmental cues. Uh, again, disproving that it's all controlled by an abstract genetic clock. I see. So you're saying that uh, genetics is a dogma that's been pretty much accepted by the culture as, as the... Uh... Um, yeah, it, uh, it, it really is um, primarily a, a kind of religious uh, belief that, uh, remember the um, Lamarck Cuvier uh, controversy, uh, the um, person who took over the museum that Lamarck had been the director of for years uh, when Lamarck was was doing his work showing the inheritance of acquired traits, the man that took over was a Christian catastrophist who uh, basically said there was no evolution. It was accounted for by a, a flood destroying the ancient uh, species and so on. So it, it, in history, uh, the genetics as um, an anti-environmental approach was strictly a biblical uh, orientation against the, uh, the whatever the Lamarckian uh, environmentalist orientation was. Yeah, I always thought the genetic uh, orientation always is very convenient for uh, liability um, in terms of you know anybody causing environmental damage, whether it be you know to your own body in terms of pollution or to the environment in general, um, they can always if you can't directly link them, you know in a in a simple cause and effect, um, they can always just say it's genetics and you are genetic. Yeah, it has been very convenient for the medical profession for the last fifty or sixty years. Uh, if it's either genetic or it's a virus, and uh, there's nothing you can do expect a cure and uh, especially with cancer uh, the government was very influential in reinforcing that interpretation uh, and that's closely related to military medical research uh, the uh, germ warfare people were getting government subsidies and uh, they were um, inclined to the it's your own fault for having bad genes theory and uh, much of the research was uh, done to uh, say that the military didn't uh, cause the problems uh, the uh, environmentalism uh, in cancer research uh, simply couldn't get funding after about 1945. Is that right? Not since 1945? Uh, it's, yeah, all, it's all been genetic? It was persisting into the early 50s, but it, it's pretty much the uh, at the end of the Second World War that the uh, a whole school of biology simply was defunded and uh, put out of existence. Uh, the idea that embryos develop according to a field, developmental field and gradients, uh, was, that was the dominant theory along with the idea that cancer is a metabolic physiological field distortion. 
uh, so embryology and cancer were related to these metabolic uh, and pattern-based ideas. Um, the the um, genetics and militaristic approach uh, simply uh, cut those off, and uh, the the best research was done through the 30s, and the war itself interrupted a, a lot of the research. But when the government came out of the war, having uh, funded the Manhattan Project, uh, that sort of money was then directed into uh, germ warfare research, and that gradually shifted to so-called cancer research. Uh, the Fort Detrick Germ Warfare Lab simply ch changed its name while not, uh, not doing very different research when it shifted over to the war against cancer. So uh, these cultural beliefs that seem to be directing um, research and taking some theories for for the truth and rejecting other theories, uh, regardless of the empirical evidence, um, they basically are also responsible for the misinformation we've heard about uh, cholesterol. Um, yeah, um, in in different ways, the uh, they talk about. Uh, genetically determined uh, tendencies towards uh, high cholesterol mm -hmm. that you can uh, see in the form of cholesterol receptors. And the, the whole idea of receptor is a genetic uh, a pharmacological idea. Um, it, it is very much like the uh, ads you see on TV where a drug zooms around in your body and goes right to the place where it's needed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's the receptor idea is like a switch that turns on a gene. Uh, and there are molecules that, that drugs and substances stick to, and those, if they have any involvement in physiology, those are called the receptor. But uh, that is promoted as a genetically determined thing. And so uh, one drug company was um, uh, collecting genes from a village in uh, the Mediterranean area where people didn't have heart disease and uh, trying to promote a, a gene change as a as a drug product, uh, but the um, environmental influences uh, simply weren't of interest because um, if you can identify a problem as a permanent genetic feature of the patient and then work on that uh, gene receptor with a drug, uh, then you've got a product. But the cholesterol receptors are regulated by hormones such as the thyroid. And so if a person doesn't have enough of the receptor, so-called, that takes cholesterol out of your uh, blood, uh, you can take thyroid and increase the amount of that receptor. Uh, but that doesn't please anyone but the thyroid industry. Hmm. And, uh, they haven't really taken advantage of it. And the thyroid industry, uh, I know a lot of people, sort of hopping around here, but I know a lot of people who do take thyroid. And um, that's, uh, there's uh, several products on the market. There's Synthroid, there's Cytomel, uh, there's uh, Sinoplus. Um, all of these are sort of aimed at uh, their thyroid hormone, which basically gets your thyroid jump-started a bit. Um, yeah, um, in the 1930s, the main product was made by the Armour Meat Company, which became the Armour Pharmaceutical Company, mm -hmm. because they had a lot of beef and pork thyroids that they didn't know what to do with, so they would sell those or the ovaries or adrenals or whatever wasn't popular as meat. They would dehydrate and sell as a drug product. 
and uh, in the 30s, that was the standard treatment, and the um, symptoms of hypothyroidism were identified, and when they would give them the armor thyroid containing both T4 and T3, uh, the, the symptoms would be alleviated. But after the war, a, a company came on the market with purified thyroxin, which is only a, a fraction of a fraction of the armor thyroid. Uh, the, the thyroid contains a protein which you digest, and then it liberates uh, the two thyroid substances, T4 and T3. But T4 is released by the gland about four times as much as the active T3, and the liver then, when conditions are right, when the environment is right, the liver completes the activation so that most of your thyroid function is really coming from the liver, which the liver is an interface with the environment. So when your nutrition calls for it, then your liver produces uh, 70 or 80 percent of the active thyroid hormone. But after the war, uh, the drug company had an interest in promoting a product, and so they said the the main substance and the easiest to make was thyroxin, and they gave it to 25-year-old male medical students, very healthy people, and said it works just like real thyroid in these healthy young men, but they didn't test it in uh, sick people or in women. And women's livers are much less active than men because of the effect of estrogen. Uh, a certain amount of alcohol takes longer for a woman to eliminate from the body than uh, in, a, in a man. So uh, the liver in general is uh, less active than females. But the drug product, thyroxin, was sold across the board, even though it had only been tested in young men. And it was more than 10 years later that uh, the uh, real active uh, hormone T3 came on the market. It wasn't even known at the time that the uh, thyroid supplement was being marketed as thyroxin. And uh, the uh, tests that determined whether you were hypothyroid or not uh, disregarded all of the symptoms that had been associated with hypothyroidism through the up until about 1945. And the tests at first measured only the iodine bound to protein, which has very little to do with your thyroid function. And according to those tests, the thyroxin product uh, would raise your protein bound iodine. And uh, so that was uh, compatible with marketing the synthetic drug. <laughs> but after about 20 years, they saw that the protein-bound iodine test had almost nothing to do with your thyroid function. If you ate seaweed, you would get a lot of protein-bound iodine, but your thyroid function would go down. And so they started looking for new ways to test the thyroid. But they had established over those 20 years that instead of half of the population benefiting from thyroid, the tests suggested that only 5% of the people would benefit from thyroid. So whatever new test came on the market, the assumption had been established in the culture that only about 5% would need thyroid. And so the uh, any new test has been standardized to that paradigm of looking at a percentage of the population rather than whether the uh, substance cures symptoms. 
And so now they are treating the uh, thyroid stimulating hormone level and disregarding the uh, actual effect of the hormone on the person's health and physiology. So they're basically treating the one of the markers instead of the actual symptoms. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to happen a lot in in uh, in, medi in, in medicine. They start mistaking the marker for the uh, for the actual problem. Yeah, and they call it a subclinical, and uh, don't even make it explicit what they mean by clinical. Mm-hmm. Uh, is the the AIDS test? I think is something like that, isn't it? Ah, uh, yeah. Um. The, um, there, there have been several uh, traditional drugs that uh, alleviate symptoms, but uh, those tend to be uh, suppressed or forgotten. Uh, but the, uh, the so-called virus has um, attracted very little attention. Uh, what they're doing now is uh, using a, a lab process to amplify a substance that uh, relates to the virus. It isn't the actual virus, but um, they uh, call it the viral load, but it, it's something they create in the laboratory. And, and meanwhile, they ignore uh, the, the use or consider them uh, simply additional therapies that could be added to the, the valuable and profitable drugs that they use to, to uh, treat the AIDS people. Um, I was going to um, talk to you about uh, Chris Masterjohn's experience in cholesterol today, but maybe we'll save that for another, another day. Um, you were going to say something else about the AIDS drugs? For me? Oh, uh, the, the, uh, there are a couple of very good books. Okay. On, on one is Inventing the AIDS Virus by Peter Duesberg, and the other one is by Harvey Bialy uh, uh, about Peter Duesberg and the virus and disease. And uh, the I've been following it now for, uh, I guess, 20 years, and the uh, establishment people just don't want to talk about it. Uh, they won't let uh, these people publish responses to uh, articles in the major journals. Uh, so the, the average doctor reading it thinks they have no answer, but uh, it's just that the editors don't want to hear their answer. And the, uh, the mainline virus theory of AIDS people have never answered the criticisms of Peter Duesberg, who basically says the virus is harmless. And in that begs the question, what's causing the harm? Yeah, Which he, is... he thinks it's a, a drug. I'm inclined to the um, idea that it's the interaction of drugs, polyunsaturated fats, radiation exposure, and other toxins in the environment. So that would be another case of an environmental problem that's... Um... Yeah, when you, when you graph the uh, incidence over the last uh, 60 years of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, it's a straight progressive increase since the uh, bomb tests began after the Second World War. And there was no sudden jump at the time AIDS became official as a disease. It's a steady increase going back 60 years. Well, that's very interesting. Well, we're just about out of time. Uh, we've been talking to Dr. Raymond Peet from Eugene, Oregon. He's a physiologist and an endocrinologist and puts out a newsletter called Ray Peet's Newsletter. And you can find him on the web at raypeet.com where you have a lot of excellent articles. Um, you're getting more and more articles up there, I've noticed, too. Yeah, I have another 10 or 15 that will go up in a couple of weeks, I hope. Great. Well, they're very interesting, and even if you don't uh, necessarily agree with everything that's said there, uh, 
plenty of food for thought, and a lot of medical history and uh, scientific history that uh, I certainly have never heard about before, so I find it all fascinating. Thanks, Ray, for your work. Okay. And, and we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. And that concludes today's broadcast of Politics and Science. I hope you enjoyed it. Other politics and science shows can be found at radio numeral four all dot net. That's radio and then the number four all a l l dot net. And once you get there, type in politics and science. I've been your host today, John Barkhausen, and please tune in again next week for another edition of Politics and Science.